All right, open your Bibles to uh, 1 Peter. In um, Peter's letters, so we're going to be starting with uh, 1 Peter today. <clears throat> and then we'll be doing 1st and 2nd. Start a study in Peter's letters. And I've entitled this study of 1 Peter, Standing Firm in the Grace of God in the Face of Suffering. Sorry. And... Uh, it's okay. And I get that from uh, chapter 5, verse 12 of First Peter. He tells us to stand firm in the grace of God in the face of suffering and persecution. So Peter wrote this letter to encourage, to strengthen the believers that, as they were going through persecution and um, suffering. And, you know, as we think about the, the Christian life, it's not, uh, to use Doug's expression, uh, he was using it yesterday a couple of times, it's not all rainbows and Skittles. When we become a Christian, things don't get all of a sudden great and the sun comes out and everything's great and you're never going to have another bad day and you're never going to get sick and nobody's going to die. And There is that lie that's circulating out there, but that's absolutely not true. Quite the opposite is true. Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation. And so as we begin this study on 1 Peter, we're going to think about, uh, you know, how do we react? What do we do in the face of suffering? Uh, Charles Spurgeon's uh, thoughts on 1 Peter. He said, let us not be mistaken. God never gave us faith to play with. Faith is a sword. But it was not made to exhibit on a parade ground. It was meant to wound and slay. Whoever has it may expect between here and heaven to learn what battle means. God has made nothing in vain. He made faith with the intent that it should be used to the utmost and exercised to the full. He says we must expect trial. Because trial is the element of faith. Faith without trial is like a diamond uncut, the brilliance of which has never been seen. A fish without water or a bird without air is faith without trial. Now that I've encouraged us, we are going to have trials. And as we know, we understand, if you've been alive for more than five minutes, you know that uh, this life is difficult and things happen and once you become a Christian doesn't mean that that's going to change but it means that we have the grace of God to carry us through. Uh, the Lord's answer to the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 when Paul pleaded with him and I, and I love the fact that it says that he pleaded with him for three times, three separate occasions that the Apostle Paul pleaded with God to remove the thorn in his flesh. Now, we don't know what that was. We can speculate, but we really don't know what the thorn in the flesh was. But he begged God to remove this thorn. And God's answer is no. God's answer was, my grace is sufficient for when your strength is gone. He says, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. And so Paul then goes on and says that I'm going to boast in my weakness because when I am weak, then I am strong because God's strength comes in and bolsters us. God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. And so as we look at this little letter, Jesus accomplished by his undeserved sufferings and what this means for the life of the Christian. What Jesus accomplished by his undeserved suffering and what this means for the life of the Christian. And so we the acknowledged um, author and he was the leader of the twelve and he, we know that it's, he's the author of it by the first word of the first verse of the first chapter 
uh, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And also in chapter 5 and verse 1, he claims to be an eyewitness of the sufferings of Christ. Um, the date that it was written, 62 and 64 AD, we're not really certain when, um, but it was probably written during the reign of Nero and probably towards the, uh, uh, the beginning of, of Nero's great persecution, uh, the reference to Babylon in, in chapter 5 verse 13 is thought to be a reference to Rome, thought to be a coded reference to Rome. And so Peter probably wrote the letter from Rome and uh, during Nero's persecution. And his purpose um, in writing the letter was uh, that his readers would stand firm in the grace of God in the face of persecution and suffering. Standing firm in the grace of God. And, and again, he'll stress this and we'll talk about this. We're not standing alone. We're standing in the grace of God. Remember, God's grace is sufficient. He'll give us the grace to get through whatever circumstance, whatever situation that we're going through. And, uh, you know, that's what he loves for us to do. Psalm 55 verse 22 says, Cast your cares upon the Lord and he will sustain you. Peter reiterates that. Cast your cares upon the Lord because He cares for you. When we're going through the difficulties of life, when we're going through sufferings, God wants us to fall back in His arms. He wants to be that shield. He wants to be that buckler. He wants to be that the one that we gain the strength from. Because as we go through this life and we endure the sufferings, we can't do it on our own. And we don't have to do it on our own. Peter wanted his readers to live triumphantly in the midst of um, hostility without abandoning hope, without becoming bitter, without losing faith in Christ, and without remembering or, or without forgetting his second coming. Jesus is coming back. And so Peter reminds us of this and he wants us to remember this. And the thought that's carried through this letter, think about this. When Christians are obedient to God's word, our lives, even in the midst of the world's antagonism, can testify to the truth of the gospel. People watch us. People see us. Uh, if we name the name of, of Christ, people are watching us. And sometimes they're watching us under the microscope. They're looking to see how we handle life. They're looking to see what we're doing in the midst of the difficulties in the situations. A lot of times they're watching so that they can laugh at us if we fall. But they're watching us nonetheless. And so if we're obedient to God's word, especially in the midst of trials and suffering, then we can be a testimony to the, to the gospel of Jesus Christ and be a great witness in the midst of that. And so as, as Peter penned this epistle, the dark clouds of the first great outbreak of, uh, of the official persecution were already gathering on the horizon. Um, under the reign of Nero, uh, the great persecution ramped up, and, and as we see, we're gonna, it, it continued to ramp up and, and, and got worse. And uh, part of that happened uh, in, uh, we think, uh, A.D. 64 when the Great Fire of Rome happened. And um, it's, the Great Fire of Rome actually was attributed to Nero himself. Nero had this great lust for building. I just talked about building more onto my deck and thinking about, but he had this great lust. He had this great desire to build. And so in order to build and fulfill that desire he burnt Rome down so that he could build it back up again he was an insane uh, kind of a person and and so when everybody uh, suspicion turned towards him he then turned to pin the blame on the Christians he already didn't like the Christians because he perceived them as enemies of Rome because they worshiped none but Christ and so the great persecution against the Christians really got ramped up when he, uh, Nero, put that blame on the Christians and said that it was them. And so as a result, uh, 
And, and it's, it's incredible when we think about this. We think about the, 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 um, the persecution that went on, the suffering that they endured. Um, as a result of his persecution, <clears throat> he would encase Christians in wax and light them on fire to, to light up his, his gardens. They were crucified. They were thrown to wild beasts. There were a lot of things that he did. He was a maniac, and he targeted Christians. And uh, think about it. It was the result of Nero's persecution that both Peter and Paul were martyred. Uh, Piro, uh, Peter and Paul were both killed under Nero's reign. And so this uh, maniacal maniac ramped up the persecution against the, the Christians. And so Peter addresses this letter to uh, Christians to bolster their faith, to encourage them, to strengthen them, to help them to stand firm in the grace of God in the face of suffering. He, uh, in, in chapter 1, verse 1, he addressed this letter to Christians residing in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, regions... Um, that were within the Roman Empire. So his audience were mostly Gentiles, although there were Jews there. Uh, the audience were mostly Gentiles. And uh, this area is now modern-day Turkey. Uh, the congregation consisted uh, you know, of Jew Jews and Gentiles, and he wanted to strengthen them. He wanted to encourage them. And so not only does Peter identify himself as the author right up front, he, uh, in his introduction, so we're just going to take a look at uh, two verses today, verses 1 and 2 today. In his introduction, he brings in um, some, some weighty theological elements. Uh, this introduction is theologically weighty. So let's look at verses 1 and 2, chapter 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with His blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. You think about it, it may seem strange to open a letter with the doctrine of election. This, uh, this doctrine is still today a highly debated and, and sometimes hated doctrine. Um, but he's not the only one that did it. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. The Apostle Paul did the same thing. Look at Ephesians chapter 1 and look at verses 4 and 5. Paul opens his letter to the Ephesians the same way. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Look at Titus chapter 1. Again, Paul does the same thing that, uh, that Peter did. Look at Titus chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth which accords with godliness in the hope of eternal life which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. And so Paul did the, the exact same thing that we see Peter doing here. He, they started their letters with this weighty theological doctrine. Um, it's a very controversial like I said sometimes a hated doctrine but Paul and Peter open their letters with no apologies he states the truth of sovereign election for what it is a reality it's a reality recognized and believed among the apostles and the early church and so even today like I said this unquestionably true doctrine is questioned by many and despised by others. Now it's a difficult doctrine, no doubt about that, but it, it's quite clear
that God has chosen those who are his. Um, and so he tells us that, it's, that we are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. That we are, listen, for those of us that are God's people, for those that are chosen, they, we are God's people because of his foreknowledge. This does not merely refer to God foreknowing that they would belong to him, but also means that he set his covenantal affection on Christians in advance for ordaining who would belong to him. Look at Romans chapter 8. And uh, let's look at tw uh, verses 29 and 30. Romans chapter 8 and verses 29 and 30. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. And so again, this is a doctrine that you can't get away from. This is a doctrine that the Bible absolutely teaches. The New Testament writers over and over again talk about this doctrine of election. Now, do I understand it all? Do I understand how it all works? No, I do not. But what I know is what the Scripture tells us is that before the foundation of the world, God foreordained those who would belong to Him. And you think about this, too. I was reading, looking at this again last night, and uh, one author said this. Think about this. Not only did God foreordain before the foundation of the world those who would belong to Him, but he also foreordained Christ to be the one that would sacrifice, be the sacrifice for the sin of those who belong to God. He foreordained that Christ would be the sacrificial lamb of God. And so you think about this. Before the beginning of creation, this was set in the mind of God. This was set in the heart of God. Now again, Peter's writing to these elect exiles. You know this word exile now, uh, of the dispersion. So, uh, so he's talking about those that were scattered. The dispersion means the, those that are scattered. And it was in, in the New Testament that, uh, that that term is usually used for those, the, the scattered Jews that were scattered amongst the, the land because of persecution. But you think about this exile. This word exile. Now, they weren't really exiled, I don't think, so much from their land as they were, I think Peter had in mind here as well, exiled strangers here on this earth. We, we are strangers. We are sojourners, the Bible tells us. As, as Christians, as believers, this ain't our home. Our home is in heaven. We have a new address when we come to faith in Christ. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. Our home is heaven. And that's where we're going to be. And so when you think about it, we're, as Christians, we're really exiles in a world in which we, we're not a part of. We, we, we're here, but we're not here. And so he says to the elect exiles, he's writing to encourage, according to the foreknowledge of God, that we were elect and so how does this work? In the sanctification of the Spirit. So the word sanctify means to set apart. It means to set apart, set apart for God's use. The objective of election is salvation, which comes to the elect through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. Sanctification begins with justification. Justification is declaring the sinner righteous or not guilty before God. And, uh, and that happens by graciously imputing Christ's righteousness to us. Paul talks about this in Philippians chapter 3. That we are imputed the righteousness of Christ through faith in Him. 
And so justification happens the moment of salvation. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ, when we trust in Him, we uh, had the opportunity. Doug was here for a little while yesterday, and so, you know, there was witnessing going on. I walked, <laughs> come, through, come through the hallway here, and he's um, coming from the dining hall, and he's in the hallway. He's got three guys there talking. And then he's in the box over there, and then the guy come to the window, and the guy, that guy in the window, I don't know, half hour later, ends up in Rampage's office. And so we're talking and witnessing and sharing the gospel to this, uh, to this guy and, you know, um, doing those kinds of things and sharing that it's all by grace, that it's all Him. It's not anything that we do. We are saved by grace through faith in Christ period. It's nothing that we do. So it's a work of the Spirit. And so the idea of justification, the moment that we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are declared righteous before God. And you think about that. His righteousness is imputed to us. His righteousness is given to us. Amazing when you think about that. Great um, transformation that takes place. And so that's justification and then, and then sanctification, the process of sanctification begins there and then continues on through the rest of our lives. It continues as a process of purification and it go, or, uh, yeah, a process of sanctification and it continues until glorification when this life is over and we're standing before our Lord and Savior and hear those wonderful words, enter in, enter in. And so this process, it's by the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God convicts the heart of sin and brings about regeneration, brings about, and even the faith that we have to do that comes from Him. And so he says, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit for, what's the purpose? For obedience to Jesus Christ, so that we should be obedient to Him. Think about this. True salvation brings about obedience to Christ. Again, Paul talks about this in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. That we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which He prepared for us in advance to do. And so He brings us to faith. He sanctifies us. He justifies us. It's the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for the sprinkling of, the, of His blood. And this simply refers to Christ's atoning work on the cross where all of our sins were washed away just as the Old Covenant was inaugurated with the shedding of blood according to Exodus chapter 24. The New Covenant as well is, is inaugurated with the shedding of blood, Christ's blood. So with the sprinkling of the blood of Christ, His atoning work on the cross was completed. It was finished. Nothing more needs to be done. Nothing more can be done. When we come to faith in Christ, and we trust in His work on the cross. It's done. It's finished. It's set. And then we're given the Holy Spirit as a guarantee. Entrance into heaven and the completion of our salvation. So He concludes this introduction. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. And again, remember who He's writing to. He's writing to the Christians that are suffering. He's writing to the Christians at that time that were going through persecution, that were enduring suffering. And, and again, it was about to ramp up. The suffering was about to get a lot worse. But he's writing to encourage them. Stand firm in the grace of God, in the face of suffering. He's writing to encourage them, and he's writing to encourage us. And he tells us the same thing. Stand firm. Don't move. Stand firm in the grace of God, in the face of suffering. God's grace is sufficient. There's nothing in this world, nothing in this life that we can go through, that we will go through, that's stronger or more powerful than the grace of God. Amen?
nothing. Think about that. Nothing. Whatever it is. In this life, it's hard, it's difficult. We go through horrendous things in our lives. But the grace of God will get us through. His grace is sufficient. And so as we look at this letter, we'll continue to see how Peter encourages the believers at that time going through suffering and persecution and how he encourages us in our day and age as we endure suffering as well. Let's pray. Father, once again, we just thank you for the truth of your word. God, that your grace is sufficient. That no matter what this life hands us, God, your grace is more powerful. Oh God, would you help us to see this as we look at this letter, as we study 1 Peter. We learn how to stand firm. We learn how to stand firm, not on our own, but God, in the grace that you extend to us. That we may endure the suffering. That we may honor and glorify you in the midst of the suffering. And Father, we'll be sure to give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.